I know that you are having a hard time right now That everything seems to crumble around you I know that you feel all alone in this world But you have to put your trust into us And we will help you through Cause we only want what's best What's best for you We have had our noses to the homeschool grindstone since last, well, summer. <laughs> and I have area after area that needs to badly be decluttered and reorganized. We are still working on the house too. We've been renovating it and finishing it since we moved in. Since the house isn't finished though and we are working on it all the time, it's taking us a lot longer to get settled in than it would normally take a family to get settled in. And of course that makes it a lot harder to get and stay organized since things are always getting moved around. But just look at how bad things have gotten around here. So I'm going to take a few days on this winter break and I'm going to try to get some order and some organization and decluttering done. And I thought that while I do this, it would be the perfect time to have a little chat with all of you. Today I wanted to do a little from the heart chit chat about homemaking through hard times and more specifically homemaking when you don't feel like you've been given a whole lot to work with. When you become a homemaker you're essentially deciding to live on one income instead of two for most of us and when you do that you're also making the choice to live more simply uh, for most of us that is. I believe that when a woman has a family and children at home that becoming a homemaker or staying a homemaker can be one of the most special and precious gifts that she can give her family and it's a ministry but it is a sacrifice in many areas and that can make it difficult at times especially in this day and age with Pinterest and social media. I have been a homemaker since 2004. It's almost 19 years now that I have been doing this. For all of those years, I've lived in homes that were either extremely small and in disrepair or homes that are under construction with the exception of our town life where we had lived in town for three years and lived in a home that was actually completely finished. <laughs> but in all my years of homemaking, that three years is the only time I've lived in a house that was what you would call finished. The rest of the time I've lived in homes that needed repair, lots of repair, and I'll just be honest, homes that were in pretty bad shape at times. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this today and talk about how I managed to not give up. Before I dive right in, I do want to be 100% honest. There are times I did give up. Like I said, being a homemaker can be really hard at times. So today, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the hard side of homemaking, and I'm going to share ways that I found to pick myself back up after falling flat on my homemaker face at times <laughs> and keep going. And I'm also going to share ways I found to get the joy of homemaking back after it had been completely lost. Also, before I dive right into this movie, I do want to do a little disclaimer. I just want to say and, and make it really clear, I love our home. If you guys have been following me for a while, you know that we recently acquired our dream home last spring. And although it is under construction and it will be for quite some time, I love it. I love it because I've lived in so much worse and there are areas of this home that are coming along so beautifully. The kitchen, for example, is dreamy. I've never had a kitchen this nice and this big and this beautiful. And so as I go through and make this video, I just want to make all of that known. And also to say it, it took us a lot longer than it takes a lot of people. I am in my 40s and I've been a homemaker for 20 years. And we just now finally got to a place in life that is where we feel like we're finally kind of getting somewhere and can breathe a little bit. This video is for those of you that started out as a homemaker, seeing it as an important job, but you're at a point where you just kind of want to give up and throw in the towel because it just doesn't seem to be working out so well. And it's for those of you that feel like you need some motivation, some hope, and those of you looking for some encouragement to keep on going.
Today we're going to talk about homemaking through tragedy, poverty, and heartbreak. Is your home in disrepair or run down? Too small? Does it have issues or is it under construction? And has it been that way for what feels unbearably long? And does it seem like there's no end in sight? If so, it's likely the situation has left you feeling like homemaking is a waste of time. And it's possible that homemaking has even become a drudgery for you. The first thing I want to say to you is if you're in this boat, you are not alone. Did you know that over half of Americans are in the low income and poverty brackets? In turn, this means many people are living in homes that they don't love or that need work. Today, I would like to tell you five ways I found to survive being a homemaker and even at times revive spark and joy in homemaking, even through all of the situations I mentioned above. But I would also like to share some big mistakes to avoid making along the way too. My prayer is that this video validates you and your struggle and that this video helps you know you are not alone and that in the end, you are encouraged to press on. I'd like to take about four minutes to share a couple pieces from my own story first though, because the tips that I'm gonna give you today won't have as much meaning or heart to you without knowing how I learned and discovered these tips. My name is Shayla, welcome to Singing A New Song, my channel about all things home, from homemaking to homesteading and homeschooling. Making a house a home, it used to be one of my very favorite things to do early on. After I married my husband, we lived in my home state for a few months, but then we moved to his Midwest home state, where we lived for about 13 years. Being new in a rural, very tight-knit area meant I didn't really have any local friends for my first years as a homemaker and new mother, but it didn't really bother me too badly. I always found things to occupy my time. My new baby boy, gardening, canning, decorating our house, painting, cooking, keeping the home clean, and starting a little herbal tincture business plus a few writing jobs kept me very happily busy. Eventually I made some acquaintances with some locals and then our daughter was born. Life was full and very busy. When I was expecting our third child, another baby boy, we experienced a tragedy. We were nearly halfway through the pregnancy with our second son when we were heavily exposed to agricultural spray. The home we were living in was very old and drafty and the spray was so thick that the spray had even gotten in our home. After that, our unworn baby no longer had a heartbeat. We learned that this is not completely uncommon. It was one of the darkest times for our family. A year later, we were expecting again. We were nervous. <laughs> we didn't know what to expect this time around. We were looking for a home and a work partner of my husband's had a very old and rough little, slightly smaller than 1,000 square foot home. It was in very bad shape. In fact, some of the windows had been busted out and it even had some wild animals living in it. We think they were raccoons. <laughs> we had agreed to buy it the year before, but somebody else had slipped in to buy it before we could. We were devastated. You see, we had been raised in, and at that time had gravitated towards very rigid religions that condemned even going to a bank for a home loan. This meant that we had no credit. We also had no options really for a home except to be lucky enough to find a rent to own home situation. Our future was uncertain and it got to the point we were even facing possible homelessness. Eventually things turned out to work in our favor. The man who slipped in on the home we were intending to buy he had done a few repairs and fixed the broken windows, but he ended up not needing the house and he wanted out of the contract that he was in to buy the home. So it was open for sale again. Since the house would not qualify for sale through a bank, it had to be owner financed. The owner, who was my husband's work partner, agreed to sell us the home on a rent to own situation. This was a huge, huge break in the storm for our little family. We were finally buying our first home. It was not easy though. The home consistently needed repair after repair because of how bad of shape it was in. We were constantly having to remove mold among fixing other serious issues. 
And since we were in a very low income bracket, it was extremely difficult. It was an ongoing struggle for many years. We had a wonderful carpenter friend who would come and help us when we needed it badly enough, but due to lack of finances to buy materials, it was always slow going. We didn't want to let the size of our home dictate the size of our family though. And our goal was to have a big family from the beginning. So we ended up fitting up to five children in that little rough and tiny home. Meanwhile, I was also homeschooling. Most people thought we were crazy. We only had one really supportive aunt and uncle that believed in us through that time. I'll be honest, it was extremely difficult. I had always thought that if we stayed faithful to the Lord that he would come through and provide for us. But I'll be honest, as the years went by, one after another, there were many times I lost hope. By the time our fifth child was born, productive days had plummeted. Most days I was just surviving. Tiny home living, it's romanticized. But the truth is, if you're a big family, homeschooling and living in a small home, a lot of time is getting lost and wasted, just spent getting through. We eventually realized that our limiting beliefs were part of the problem and we broke down and went to get a loan. Unfortunately, we had next to no credit and were denied. I remember walking out of the bank that day and just feeling so hopeless. A year later, a friend told me about another bank to try and so we did try again. And since the bank manager knew my husband, he approved a loan for us. I was expecting our fifth child at the time. A few months after our fifth was born and with the help of some friends who volunteered labor, angel friends, <laughs> they were awesome we were able to put an addition on the home, making it 1,400 square feet. This is still small for a family that was seven, a family of seven at that time, but it helped so much. A year later, we were able to put one more addition on, making the home around 1,800 square feet. Again, still small for a family of seven, but much better than what it was. It had doubled our home size just about. We were never actually able to finish that home though. So it was always under construction. Living in a home that is always under construction, that is too small for your family's needs or is in really bad shape, it can definitely put a damper on the joy of homemaking. And if you're homeschooling like we were and in the home around the clock with a bunch of children, it can make the predicament even more strenuous. Of course, dealing with tragedies, sickness, and loss can also crush the joy of homemaking. So if the joy of homemaking has been lost to you, how do you get that joy back? Currently, our family is living in a large home that is beautiful to us. However, it is still under construction and it will be for some time because we're doing the work ourselves as we are able and as, as we have time when we're not working or homeschooling. So in other words, we're working on it at snail's pace. <laughs> By the way, I am not complaining about our current home being under construction because it's spacious and progress is happening. And to me, after what we have been through, it is something. We went through 13 years of not having anything like this, so this is a big deal for us. I wanna share what I learned though through the years of living in, for lack of better wording, dumpy and under construction homes. The first tip is to know your worth. You have likely heard the phrase, a woman's home is her castle. For some women and people in general, if their castle is defective and dumpy, it can be really difficult not to take this as a personal reflection of themselves. I can remember one time as I was trying to clean mouse dander from kitchen drawers in the home we were buying in the Midwest. And I was trying to paint the inside of the drawers to block the germs and the smell. At that point we were dealing with and had been through some extended family trauma and turmoil and I was already just so broken. As I was trying to fix these dilapidated and very stinky drawers and make the best of them, I remember feeling so despondent and of course really grossed out. <laughs> I remember crying and asking God, is this all I'm worth? For your information, 
I, I do want to insert here that ironically, every single home I have moved into has had alarmingly bad animal stains that definitely would not have passed a home inspection. In that home, one of the previous owners had actually had a python, we were told. I still cringe when I think about that. After that home went vacant, it had wild animals living in it at one point. And when the previous person before us went to put the flooring down, they did not remove the carpets. And so we kept having serious allergy issues and we didn't know why for about a year until we realized they had never removed the carpets underneath the flooring they put down. That was a big mess. When we moved away from that home and into our second home, we had actually bought the home site unseen because we were coming in from the Midwest, almost 1,700 miles away. And so we bought the home that we had in town that's in my videos previous to the home we're living in. We bought it sight unseen and we had to remove dog and duck pet stains. Yes, yes, I said duck. Ducks were allowed in the home that we lived in, in town. And it took us years to repair the damage. In our present home, there were literally hundreds of cat spray and urine stains that we had to remove. I'm actually still in the process of removing them. I will link to what we found that works to eliminate pet stains if you were dealing with something like that, because we did find something that works amazingly. But the reason I'm telling you all of this is to tell you that I understand it can be really easy to feel like, well, <laughs> the same crap you were cleaning up sometimes. And I know it can become really difficult to remember your worth when you are going through hard living situations like this. Here is something I always found helpful to remember. My worth when life was bringing me down. It was to compare. Yes, you heard me right. This is one time where comparing can be a really good thing. <laughs> I know we hear a lot about comparing being a bad thing, but here's one time where you do want to compare. Compare yourself to other good people you know that are going through and have gone through some of these same problems. But don't compare yourself to minimize your daily struggles. Compare your circumstances to ask yourself, is their life circumstances, meaning that God loves them less and sees their value equal to the situations that they're in or going through. My point is that it's easy to believe that God cares about others going through challenges, but it is not so easy to give ourselves the same grace. When we realize that we are in great company, it becomes a lot easier to know and feel God's love for us despite hardships. Personally, I have always noticed that my very favorite people to be around and learn from or the ones who had been through the most, <laughs> for lack of a better word, crap in their life and found a way not to let it make them bitter. Okay, so here's another tip that I have. Build credit. Debt is a double-edged sword, but that does not mean you should avoid it at the cost of your family's health, sanity, and wellness. My husband and I were both taught growing up that going into debt was essentially a sin. Until we were in our 30s, we were part of faiths that taught this and emphasized debt is evil. So until we were in our 30s and life had gotten so bad for us, we didn't work on building credit. When things got so bad for us that basic needs were starting to go unmet, that's when we realized, wait a minute, God promises to meet our needs and they're not being met. This is when we realized that we were living by man-made standards and not God's. Friends, there's a difference between religion and true Christianity. God was not asking us to go without. Religions were. Okay, so here's another tip that I have for you. It's kind of a hard one. Gratitude can be a life raft. People romanticize tiny home, debt-free living. But the truth is that every rose has its thorns. You have heard the phrase time is money and for tiny home, debt-free living for a single income, growing homeschooling family, you really get a good view of just what that looks like. Living in a dumpy and worse, a tiny dumpy house, can be a lot of work, a lot of time, and a lot of money. Through our years of living like this, the thing that always brought me down the worst was the amount of time that felt wasted each day due to our specific home. We didn't have storage space, so decluttering and staying on top of switching out clothing each season, plus as the kids would grow, it was an every other month necessity, if not more often. Time had to be spent moving things around and shifting them around in and out of storage 
constantly. Even the laundry took extra time because in our situation, the washer was in the middle of the house and our dryer was on an outdoor porch on the other side of the house. <laughs> For many years, dishes took eight hours a week to hand wash because there was no place or money for a dishwasher. We won't even talk about all of the school supplies and books that needed constant shuffling around simply because we had no place for them. Another thing that would always bring me down was we kept having to eradicate mold. So any money we would save ended up needing to be spent gutting walls that never actually got finished. It was all exhausting. There was one thing that would lift me up every time though. I had this little thing that I would do, despite the poor living situations, I would go from room to room and thank God for this space. This never failed to lift my spirits. Another tip that I have is to lean into God and your relationships. Difficult living situations can have a way of causing friction in all of your relationships. And the longer they draw on, the longer the challenge. Being aware of this is half the battle though. It takes some vigilance and work, especially for spouses to remain close in low income, poverty, poor housing situations. It may even take counseling as it did for us, especially for me. On the upswing though, once you learn how to lean into each other with understanding and love, the relationships, they can become far deeper than they would have been without the hardship. And the same goes with your relationship with God. You know, when I look back at pictures of our first homes, I remember the hard times and struggles. But more than that, I remember the love between my husband and I and our children. One of my last tips is to not give up. Don't give up. Do what you can. It can be really easy to throw in the towel because What's the point, right? There were many times I would temporarily give up on our dumpy homes. I just couldn't stay there though because that only made the living situation and being in the home so much worse. One time as I was trying to clean our home, <laughs> it was in such bad disrepair that it was not very cleanable. <laughs> if you have ever tried cleaning a super rundown place, you know exactly what I'm talking about and I don't need to explain what that's like to you. But as I was trying to clean it, my husband was nearby and he was a little exasperated too. He said, it's like polishing a turd. I know that sounds terrible. And I actually got mad at him for saying it <laughs> because keeping the house clean helped me so much. So did homemaking and doing whatever I could to improve the situation in place. I have a little bonus side tip here for you guys. Paint, paint covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> One time we needed to buy new windows, but they were smaller than the previous windows. My husband was able to patch under them to close them off from outside. But in the house, it had paneling all around and he wasn't quite sure how to fix it because our ultimate goal was to have sheetrock put up, but we didn't have the money for it. So it stayed like this for years because we needed to remove the paneling and replace it with a drywall, but we never had the money. So I would sit there nursing my babies and my eyes would always fall on those areas, those holes in the wall, and it would drive me crazy. Finally, I got the idea to paint the exposed inside guts of the wall the same color as the wall and to put shelves, little shelves inside the wall for books and kids items. It was a unique idea. Uh, it looked a little different, but you know what? It looked a lot better than it had before. And it gave me a little more storage space. In Luke 16, 10, it says, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. In Luke 19, 26, it says, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. My point is, if you have a dumpy house and it bothers you, don't give up, do what you can to make it better. Cleaning, painting, homemaking, gratitude, all of these things can help you feel better and can actually help you find peace and gratitude, which is a lifesaver to keep you afloat until things get better. Mm -hmm.